uh, attending to that uh, time, and we'd be happy to start taking questions. Anything that uh, folks can think of, although we may reserve the right to defer some questions into the mm -hmm. afternoon session if it's something that um, we have uh, programmed in. Yes, sir, on the right. Hi, Dr. Pieserker. I'm Jonathan Epstein. I'm with uh, NICHD. So, like you, we face this problem with dbSNP, where you, it's, it's hard to trust it, and it's hard to dig deep enough to know whether you can trust it or not. Now, you internally uh, at NISC have your own, your own genomes, your own exomes, and I've, um, I've, I've heard that you uh, might release some of, that, some of that data for other people to use as, as, uh, for quality control and SNP filtering, and I just wondered what the status was of that project. Yes, yeah, so uh, we're um, in the process of uh, depositing those data into uh, dbGaP, the database of genotypes and phenotypes, so that will then be publicly available quite soon as well. Uh, we can't transfer the entire um, results set to people for collaborative use, but on a reasonably uh, sized throughput basis, if people have inquiries with respect to the frequency of variants in particular genes or smaller sets of genes, we're happy to download those and provide summary statistics on variation uh, detection in that cohort, and especially if, uh, are, and are you using NISC for your sequencing? No, we're not. Okay, so that there is this thing about um, I think a platform compatibility. I, ideally, what you want is I think a platform, a sample set for controls that was generated under as similar a set of conditions and processes as possible. So this would be less than ideal, but it is certainly available to you and to other um, practitioners uh, in the audience or uh, online. If you have requests, please do let us know, and we're happy to share those data for control purposes. You want to say something, Jim? I'll, I'll just. A little further in what you said, yes, it'll, it'll all be de deposited into dbGaP, but we're also submitting just the, the variants that we have discovered in ClinSeq and releasing the frequency data on those uh, into dbSNP as well, or something like that, a, a VCF-type file that you can work with. So it'll be available that way. Eventually, it would come out through the dbGaP method as well as frequency information for all the samples. So. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question for uh, Dr. Mulligan. Uh, and I'm Wojciech Husser from Clinical Center. Uh, you mentioned uh, the depth of coverage, let's say 60 times or 100 times. Yeah. And then you, you mentioned the MPG as the measure of quality. And you went pretty fast through your talk. Okay. And I didn't really get that, let's say, one year into the future. Uh, what is the... What is the, the good measure of quality? Because I'm, I'm not an expert on the genetics. I, I work with data, with clinical data, but this will be increasingly more important. Uh, my other question is, uh, I understand there's always this error in reading the basis. So uh, kind of a naive question. If I, if I take the same DNA and send, send it to your lab uh, in January and send it again in December, uh, what's the likelihood I will get the exact same data set back? And I'm meaning not those 15 terabytes, the, so many reads. I just want the one, the clean, the, the kind of the cleansed, aligned, and, and perfect read. Yeah, so that, that's a very good question. And in fact, it's, um, it is a challenge for certain projects that have a very long duration, is that the technologies that we used a year ago, <coughs> we don't even have access to now, for example, some of the chemistries that are used on the Illumina machine, um, they outdate and you have to move to the next one. So you're going to have different sensitivities as things move forward. Now, Illumina, as the example here, I'm sure it happens with other technologies as well, is um, uh, they, they, they are always trying to improve things so that they get better balance between high GC and low GC regions of the genome. So to answer your question, if you sent a sample in January uh, of this year and then sent one again now, how similar would the results be? There, there will, it won't be exactly the same because everything's changed underneath. It may be a different capture kit, um, so you'll have better coverage, so you, you'll have new sites that have variants that were never interrogated before. So um, now, let's see, and other things change, too. It's a changing field. It's just rapidly changing. I could go on and on about other things that could change, but the direction that we're moving is in is that the, um, the, the samples that are sent at a later time 
should have a, a, a better set, to overall set, than the ones earlier because things have been improved upon. I hope that answers your question. I just might add, I think, you know, remember when you're sequencing a genome either by shotgun or exome, there is a inherent there is an inherent randomness to that process. Where those reads come from and where they, where they come from and how much coverage you have at any given position is a function of probability. So I would say that the chance of getting exactly the same result with all of the same calls and all of the same MPG scores for two different genomes, that chance of that happening is zero. And so that you should take that into account and I think that's a factor in your decision about how many samples you want to sequence for your project because there is a variation in the assay that's intrinsic to, you know, multiplex sampling uh, of a genome that is going to vary from one experiment to the next. Then you have to decide uh, how much money you want to spend, how many times you want to sequence, how many samples you want to sequence, and how deep you want to go to make those determinations. Well, hopefully the old data has already yielded results, so it's enormously valuable because it's already published. Now, if it's something that did not yield a result, then you may want to go back and try it again or, you know, think of a new experiment. Is it maybe a translocation instead of, you know, maybe it's a small uh, 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 change in the genome that isn't being able to be, you can't pick up with the, uh, with the capture, exome capture. So you just need to rethink your approach for samples that have failed in the past. There may be um, later presenters talking about what you can do for those system for those families, for example, that may not have succeeded in the past. Hi, Anelia Horwood from NICHD. So I have no experience with Illumina, but I've been using Solid from Applied Biosystems for the last year. And it seems like one of the biggest challenges we face is that when we apply two different analysis pipelines on the same data set, we never get more than 70% overlap in the results. And actually, this is illustration how many false negatives we have, and it addresses the question of sensitivity. So I just want, and again, it doesn't address the capture or incomplete capture or missing gene or something like that. Because every time when we look in the IGV files, we are able to see the mutations there. They're just not caught by one or the other, or another pipeline. And we were considering approaches like um, making a union of the diff applying different pipelines and un making union of all of them. So I was just wondering if you see something similar and how do you handle it? We haven't seen anything that severe. Uh, we have investigated different aligners. Um, and when we tried to use the BWA aligner versus the, the DIAG CM one that we're, we've been using for a long time, we saw a number of differences, maybe more like a 90% uh, overlap, so not the low 70% that you have, but we decided that it was best just to stay with the system that we had been using all along and try and switch and, uh, and maybe throw things off. We, we thought we, what we were actually doing was better than, than switching to a different aligner. So. So you were testing the alignments, not the, not the post-alignment calls, I mean, steps. Um, if you, so if you're working from the same align, alignments and getting different calls after that. Um, yeah, that's what we observe. That actually. sounds very challenging, and I don't have experience with the, the solid okay. Thank you. data analysis. I would just follow up. One thing that we did do, which gives you an idea, though, about um, variability is um, I don't think anybody talked about where we did the genome, the shotgun, and the exome from the same DNA sample. Did, was that mentioned? We, we didn't talk about them. Yeah, that's Jamie significant. has done some uh, comparisons. Yeah, do you, want, do you want to just summarize that very briefly about what, what you saw in one versus the other? So um, in this particular test, we did uh, whole genome sequencing and then exome sequencing and used the same analysis tools to compare, and there um, um, it's sort of a different question. In this case, the concurrence, uh, the agreement was extraordinarily high, I think, um, a discordance of 1 in I think, 10 to 20,000. Um, so applying the same methods to even different capture, uh, the same analysis methods to different um, sequencing methods in our hands uh, seem to give a high agreement. Um, however, that's sort of different than the question of different analysis methods on the same data. 
Um, and a lot of the, some of the different methods do use different assumptions and different um, dials and knobs to tweak different parameters, and that can make a big difference. Uh, it's a challenge. Max? Uh, Max Münke, NHGRI. Les, I was very intrigued with the examples that you gave for the different inheritance patterns, and of course it was very instructive to go through them one by one and to think about the families that we have in the lab and what we might want to do. I was even more intrigued by what you said that other colleagues shared their data that in essence really it was only about 30 to 40 percent that led to success. So that's really the bottom line. And what I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit, what the pitfalls were or what people were guessing. If you don't have a solution, it's hard to guess. But then the other question that I have is what is technology and what's biology? And with biology, I mean what would you expect to be found in exons and what would you expect to find in non-exon exonic sequences? Yeah, so I think the ceiling ought to be probably in the... 80 or 80 to 85 percent range. I think our, our experience, and you've done as much of this as we have uh, in positional cloning, when you have a trait and you are certain that it's Mendelian and you know you have mapped it to a locus and you have a family and you know you've sequenced the genes, you know that 10 to 15 percent of the variants are not variants that are assayable by PCR and 3100 or by exon interrogation because they are control elements, deep splicing elements, so there's the biology that pushes out a good number of them. Copy number variants, as I mentioned, are not readily assayable by exome sequencing, although some efforts are being made. And as well, the, all of the foibles that I listed of not recognizing the genes, not completely targeting them, the capture, uh, that, that distribution that Jim showed of that wide distribution. Did you notice on the left side it, it, it slipped upwards at zero? Right. There is a decent amount of the exome that has zero coverage when you do an exome experiment. And that's an issue. And as well, the graph that Jim showed with the tail off of alignment for base pairs of uh, indels. So a six base pair indel, which we know we've seen in Mendelian disorders, it's very difficult to find those. And so those are, there's just plenty of reasons for that. And then I think the other considerations are, you know, it, it may just be some of these families that have been selected for these projects were just really weren't good candidates. Maybe they're not as Mendelian as we think they are. Um, maybe they're teratogenic for all we know. So environmental causes we are not going to find with the, the GA2. Do you want to comment on that? I think maybe you were alluding to also is the, uh, if you're just going after the exome, how much is going on in the rest of the genome? So we're only interrogating 2 percent of the genome uh, uh, with, with good coverage like less just talked about, but is there something else going on in the intergenic regions or, or like some, some diseases could be uh, an insertion in the intron of an alu element or a deletion that would cause skipping of that, of an exon cause of disease. We wouldn't pick that up necessarily by exome sequencing. So there's various classes like that that if we aren't interrogating it, we won't see it. And you may not see it well with whole genome sequencing if it's, a, uh, if it's an, an alu repeat a recent ALU repeat, you won't get coverage there anyway because your reads won't align nicely if you did a whole genome. So there's challenges all around. Exome is a good first step, as I pointed out in my initial statement. Uh, just one more comment on that. Um, there is certainly um, a failure isn't completely useless. Um, I don't know if Dr. Adams is going to talk about uh, an example later on, but there was an example where um, no variant was identified, but in carefully looking at what was covered and what was not covered, it suggested some follow-up experiments with Sanger sequencing that then did uncover the correct variant. So um, sort of knowing what you, or I guess you do know what you haven't identified, is that has value in itself, too. I am Atik from NIDCD. My question is about uh, exome capture kits, which you mentioned. One of them is Illumina true capture or something like 62 megabases kit. So is it possible to capture the DNA using Illumina 62 megabases kit and then 
do the next gen sequencing on a platform other than the alumina or is it as platform specific i'm not sure about that i there, i'm i'm sure there would there could be a way to do that because it is just it's dna probes that are hybridizing it doesn't necessarily have to have the adapters of of the alumina uh, kit around it to to pull that out jamie you might have a sense of that yeah i i'm actually not sure either um as jim alluded it, it should be possible um definitely a, uh they um i believe they make the whole protocol available online um so have a look at that and then contact them because i believe it should definitely be possible for any platform to sequence given that your library was prepared appropriately for that platform before the actual capture steve yeah marks <clears throat> and idk uh, today we're dealing with a uh, very powerful, wealthy uh, methodology. It's all from the NIH, and I wonder a little bit about other centers. Is, first of all, is there redundancy with other centers, for example, ch China? And second of all, are there areas of major disagreement that we're not hearing about? Um, I'm sure there are. <laughs> And I think, you know, this technology is so new, um, a lot of the things that we are doing are uh, the polite term that my um, uh, informatics and computational people use is called a heuristic. I sometimes call it um, making things up as I go along and see to the pants. And we're trying, and I think, I hope I gave a flavor, and I think Yardena's presentation was the same. We're trying lots of different things, and I think some of the things we're trying probably really aren't all that clever, which is probably an answer as well to Max's question, which is that the variants are actually there, and our analytic algorithms and our filtering are not allowing us to see them. And so we have to work on that. One of the things I've been intrigued with that we've talked about a little bit is the unaligned fraction. So we are all focusing here on what aligns to the genome that we can look at and compare to the reference sequence. And there is a fair amount of sequence that's generated by these instruments that's sitting in the computers as the unaligned fraction. One of the potential reasons that it's unaligned is that there is a genomic variation, substantial one, that's preventing that alignment from occurring and that that is the variant that's causing the, the disease in the patient that you're studying. But, that's what, well, what about the question of controversy? I mean, are there people that say, you guys are doing it all wrong and it should be our way? I haven't been hearing a lot of that. <laughs> No, I, I just met with a group from BGI last week, and we were uh, talking about uh, all of the analysis methods that both groups are using, and, and we're both faced with the same challenges, and, and we're both excited about the same uh, possibilities. So there, were, there wasn't anything that came up in that meeting that was a, any disagreement uh, at that stage, yeah. And just to add to that, it's nice when um, other groups use different methods and uh, find the exact same genes and the exact same mutations, and I think that in itself is just a, a replica and a good control that things are being done right by different groups. And I think it's also worth saying that we're not here to effectively represent all approaches and all viewpoints on these questions. What the four of us each described is how we have chosen to solve the problems that we have been faced with, and these are one or a couple approaches, and there are more approaches, and other people are using different captures and different sequencing instruments and different aligners and different base callers and different filtering strategies, and there's a universe of uh, variables out there, and I'm sure that there are some that would work better than ours, uh, but ours are working fairly well, and you are free to take from us what you think would work for you and ignore what doesn't. So uh, I have a question to Dr. Biesecker. Uh, you presented an interesting research agenda to focusing on all those 2,500 diseases uh, and including maybe the functional side of it, but basically getting some exomes or families Affectants uh, was an interesting term. Uh, and uh, let's say we 
kind of went through all of them. Uh, and you also mentioned an interesting example. What can we learn from this hereditary osteoporosis which has impact on, on general osteoporosis? So once we have uh, kind of used up all the, all the diseases, the monogenic diseases we, we can go after, what, what's the next step? Or uh, is, is this the end of that we can go only go after? What's the, uh, the polygenic disease? Is there any hope to go after these in a similar fashion? And I think the uh, other um, whole domain that you didn't include in your question is the somatic question, which Yardena uh, uh, talk exemplified. So I think we have a huge amount of work in front of us, and I was careful to try and use the phrase uh, recognized clinical entities because I don't for a second think that, that it, those sources of knowledge represent all clinical entities. And as you well know, and a nice paper that was published that showed, and I can't remember, was it exome or whole genome, the uh, Medical College of Wisconsin case? I can't remember, but it was next-gen sequencing used as a clinical diagnostic tool because the patient had a very atypical presentation of an autoimmune inflammatory bowel disease that was not clinically recognized by the clinicians. They sequenced it, found a high penetrance variant in that gene, and then, in retrospect, they could say, oh, yes, this is an unusual presentation of a disease we, in fact, know and recognize. And so I think this technology will diffuse out and be used for all, all dimensions of uh, analysis, both in the research lab and in the clinic. And I think, essentially, forever in the, in the cancer somatic sequencing world. Another application, as Les was alluding to, is that in the clinical domain, in cancer, for example, you can imagine that these um, um, discoveries will be applied at some point to the clinic. There will be drugs. There are already drugs that are being given based on these mutations. There's resistance that develops after that drug is given. And to find out what the resistance mechanism is, again, these technologies could be used to find out in an unbiased manner what that resistance is. Uh, and so th this keeps rolling over. It will be applied again and again um, in the future. Oh, there's plenty to do. I mean, that's... The Mendelian disorders are really just the low-hanging fruit of the heritability of human disease. And we and our colleagues, I think internationally, I think are focusing on Mendelian diseases because it is a more tractable problem mathematically and statistically for analyses of these data sets. And it is only a matter of time before this starts crossing over into the multifactorial polygenic world but we'll need much larger control sets and case controls uh, type study designs to extract that kind of information. And as you all are well aware, for those of you who take care of Mendelian disorders, the, the determination of the primary genetic variant that is causative of a Mendelian trait is, f is far from explaining all of the variation of that disorder in an individual. And there are modifiers that affect those traits those data are potentially extractable from exome and genome analysis as well. So we have plenty of work to do. I, I'm, not wor I'm not worried about us running out of uh, projects, at least in my lifetime. So I think it'll be fun. Yeah, it's a start. Yeah, exactly. Hi, this is Rinki from NEI. And I have a question about the X exome data you presented. So you said there is a need of a different variant color because of its hemizygous status. And uh, because I did run XLRP family, and what I'm seeing a lot of heterozygous variants. I sequenced hmm. three affected males and uh, very few homozygous, which I would expect. And I was using the standard variant color which you would use for autosomes. And uh, so I was not even aware until I heard from you. So can you elaborate on that? And well, what I, variant color should I be using? So it's, it's very important to know what part of the genome you're, you're analyzing. And if it is a male sample and you're looking at the X or the Y chromosome, you do need to handle those carefully. If you uh, have the 
wrong information somewhere in your pipeline and think it's a female sample and it's really a male and you call heterozygotes on X, you're going to get things that just, you're going to get a lot, it's going to generate false positives because the model is going to try and find something that is uh, potentially heterozygous uh, from the data and will call things and it will, and those will clearly be wrong because it should be homozygous in those regions unless it's something else strange going on in the genome that can happen. Um, but the caller that we're using is the MPG uh, package. It's available online through NHGRI's research webpage. So you can, you can download uh, the program. It's called BAM to MPG. And it has a flag that you can use in there and state, I want to call this region as a single copy, uh, hemizygous region. And you can give the coordinates. And so if it's, uh, if, it's, if it's a male sample, then you can just give the regions of the pseudo-autosomal, non-pseudo-autosomal regions on X and Y. And also that uh, the capture in that X chromosome, it was com less compared to the other autosomes. Do you see that also in your samples? Like my average capture was around 90, 92%. But in the X chromosome in the region where I was looking for my gene of interest, there I saw at least 30, 40% genes not being covered. Could it be because of the X chromosome or something like that? Was this the Agilent X exome kit? It is. No, I used the whole exome kit because I was doing X chromosome as well as some autosome. So I just ordered one kit and I did the. Oh, you did the whole exome? Yes. And only looked at the X? Yes. And you had a. For lower, one family, yes. Or maybe it was just a depth of sequence and. Well, oh, here's another answer is that, or possibility, is that uh, if you analyze the data um, with a heterozygous collar. Mm hmm. That's what the X chromosome will only be covered half as much because there's only one copy of X yeah. for two copies of Y. So you're going to have lower coverage and yeah. won't have enough coverage to start to call the heterozygotes that you don't want okay. to look at anyway. No, but I was looking in the genome browser, like IGV, for yeah. the capture uh, and the depth of coverage, and I saw a like, lot of exons because I went by exon by exon because I knew this is the... So it was the already positional mapping family, so I knew where I am expecting my mutation to be. And when I looked at gene by gene, I saw less coverage compared to. Well, it, you only have one copy of X for two of the autosomes. Yeah. That could be No, I should be trying that, that yeah. uh, thing you mentioned. Thank you. I think another thing that points out as well is, um, again, we're working towards, because we're at early days, um, X is not the only part of the genome that people have a single copy of, right? We know that there's copy number variation throughout the genome, and one thing we all want to be able to do is to recognize a point in the genome where we have one allele that we are deleted for, and the other allele we have one copy of, and in fact, we ought to be, if we could recognize those and implement single allele base calling when they're in trans with the deletion, that would improve our power. And those are things we're just not seeing as well. And the converse is when you have three copies of an allele, what is your caller going to do? It's not going to call those bases right, and, and you're going to make mistakes. So that, that's a, a refinement that needs to be implemented, but we're a ways from that. And I'm sure your identity is quite interested in having, you know, if you could just figure out the copy number across your tumor sample, then you could correctly call it each location. And that's something we would like to get to at some point, but it's, uh, that would be the optimal way to, to process tumor samples. I'm sorry, I may not have fully understood, like, the previous conversation, but I have a more specific question about my project. I was looking at a... Uh, region of homozygosity where I was expecting all the homozygous variants and I, I have found that there are quite a few heterozygous variants and I was thinking it could be because like, there could be simply false positive or platform errors or something like that but is it possible that there is actually a copy number variation and that's why I am, uh, I am finding those heterozygous variants because I am using I'm not using the... So, so if it's homozygous... Um, theoretically, all the variants in that region... How, how, how is it homozygous? Is it, is because it inherited uh, I have the same a copy from mother and father? Well it well-defined uh, linkage region for okay, a recessive... It, okay, is it... So then it's, this, it's um, identity by descent mm -hmm. in that region? So then, uh, again, you should... 
there you could be using a heterozygous collar in that region, I mean, a, a collar for, for diploid samples, but if, it, if you know it's really uh, identity by descent, the only thing that will be real will be anything that somatic changes between the two copies, right? Uh, or not very recent changes between the individuals, yeah. So, uh, again, you, you, you should see a, a, a huge reduction in the heterozygosity. Did you see that in that region? And we can well, talk I am about actually it. seeing uh, heterozyg more than expected heterozygosity. Okay, we, we should That's talk right. about this maybe uh, yes. afterwards, yeah. Okay. Uh, if there are no other um, urgent questions, I think we should break for lunch. We look forward to having people uh, come back. And I think our start time is at uh, 1.15, I believe, is our start time. Yep. And uh, as well, we welcome, uh, encourage the web viewers to uh, rejoin us at that time. Thank you all very much.